It's a wonderful day, isn't it? Beautiful day. Gorgeous. Not too hot yet. We like it that way. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, how do, I, how do I drive into today's message? Because we are about to study something really exciting. The names and so-and-so begat so-and-so. It's going to be awesome. He bet. And you know, I, I got to thinking about this. You know, we've been studying the book of Genesis. And we, you know, as you know, we go through the Bible chapter and verse. But why do we do that? Because we believe it's the word of God. Which means that every word, even the names, the Holy Spirit made sure that for 4,000 years, these names were here. So there's some reason he wanted us to know these names. Don't you think? And there's so many people that, you know, they dismiss this kind of thing. And it's easy to do that. This is the thing that you read over real quick. You know, I'm going to read through the Bible cover to cover, but we read this stuff really fast. So and so, okay, we got to the end. Let's get to the good stuff. Everybody does it? <laughs> just as guilty? Almost switched into French there, just to let you know. I am guilty. I mean, it's just, you know, I've done it too. But since the Lord led us as a church to go through the Bible, chapter and verse, the Holy Spirit slowed me down, put on the brakes, and said, I want you to pay attention here. Boy, am I glad I did. I found a few things in here. Let's go see if we can't find it together. But before we do, and before we get into that, we've got to figure out why we should care in the first place. It kind of reminds me of the story of a mother who took her little boy shopping. He's about five. Take the kid shopping. He's been shopping all day. And you know how a five-year-old is when he's been shopping all day. He's ready to do something new. At the end of the day, you know, they're getting all their packages and everything. And, and, and uh, uh, one of the clerks hands the kid a lollipop. lollipop and, and mother immediately says, what do you say? And he goes, charge it. <laughs> you see, we forget we don't realize how much of an influence we're having, do we? We, we miss that part. And th sometimes we really need to understand how much of an influence we have even when we're not trying to have an influence. It's important to understand this. And I think we're going to see when we get into Genesis chapter 10 that there's an influence here we didn't even know was there. Does that make sense? Just like this mother did not know that she was influencing the child to be a credaholic right from an early age. I also think that when we look at this passage, it's going to teach us that we need to take care of the influence that we have. Who can say amen to that? We gotta be, we've got to be, we got to be watching this. Now, let's take a look at the context. We're actually going to finish off. Uh, Genesis chapter 9. We're going to do the last few verses of it to lead us into chapter 10. I thought that would be a, a better move. And the context is, this is right after the great flood. The flood has happened. The whole world has been wiped out. And they're getting off the boat. God has been speaking to them in chapter 8, chapter 9. And this is kind of like a sum. It's a summary. We're going to compress probably a couple of hundred years into a few verses here. It's a, it's a real summary. And this is long enough after the flood that Noah was able to plant a vineyard and the grapes were able to grow enough that he was able to raise grapes and make wine. So we, have, we know that this has been a significant amount of time. Does that make sense? Even though it's compressed into a few verses. And we saw last week, what we learned last week is that even if you've been serving God for 600 years like Noah has, how many of you know you, you can't let your guard down? I don't care how long you've been serving God. If you want to truly serve the living God, you cannot let your guard down. And that's what we learn from Noah. Now, in uh, chapter 9, verse 20, it kind of sums it up. It says, Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk. So he let his guard down, and he did something monumentally dumb. And he lost his dignity. So he became uncovered in his tent, verse 22, and Ham, that's his son, the father of Canaan, that's his grandson, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Now, we covered this a little bit last week, and we said that something happens here. We're not exactly sure what it is. There's a hint of some kind of sexual abuse or sexual molestation here. 
because of the word saw his nakedness. Because there's nothing wrong with actually seeing somebody in the buff. And the reason we know that is because if it was true that there was a problem with seeing somebody in the buff, every time you change your kid's diapers, you're in deep trouble. Among other things, you're in deep, up to your elbows. But anyway, the point is, that's not the issue. We're not exactly sure. Some scholars think that there was some kind of an abuse here. Other scholars are going, no, I think it's, he goes outside and tells his brothers and he's mocking and he's disrespectful and he's rebellious. And that was the problem. Either way, it really doesn't matter. Something happened here. But look what happens in verse 25. And this is kind of strange. Then Noah said, cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, or Yapeth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Verse 28. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, so all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Second oldest person in history. Lived a long, long time. But isn't it odd? How many of you noticed that it was Ham that did something, but Canaan gets a curse? Do you see that? I mean, Canaan's nowhere to be found in this story, is he? I mean, Ham is the one that saw his father in the tent. So why does Canaan get this curse when it's Ham who did whatever it is that Ham did? That we're not really sure about. Why curse Canaan? You know, Ham also had other sons and daughters. We know this. And at least three of the others are mentioned. We're going to find out in chapter 10. He, had, he was the father of Cush, Mizraim, and Put. And yet, Canaan's the one that gets this curse. And I get to thinking about that. Now, the first thing we need to understand about this passage is it does not give us the time intervals involved. Does that make sense? It's compressed. We do not know. See, um, how did Noah know that something happened to him in his tent? He's passed out. Someone had to tell him. Does that make sense? There's been a passage of time here. You know, Noah's done something silly, gotten, lost his dignity, got in trouble. Something happens. They have to tell him about it once he wakes up. So in other words, listen to me carefully on this. This is not a knee-jerk reaction. Ham, you did something, so I'm going to curse your son. That's not what it is. Now, the reason I know that, that there's been a passage of time, is because if you jump down to verse 29, just, just, just two verses later, it says he died. Right? So you know what this really is? Think about this for a second. This is not a reaction. This is really a sum. This is, this is what happened, and then later, when Noah is getting ready to kick the bucket, he has his last words. We see this in other passages, don't we? I mean, if you've read the Bible before, you know that when Jacob was getting ready to check out, what did he do? Gathered all his kids around him and started passing out blessings, didn't he? He had his last words. Moses did the same thing. When Moses was getting ready to leave, he said, let me pronounce blessings on the different tribes. We see this in the Old Testament a lot. I don't know how these old guys knew they were going to check out. I mean, it's not like we had modern technology where they could, you know, check and go, okay, I'm going to have a heart attack in the next hour. But somehow they knew they were going to die, so it's time for me to pass out these pronouncements. In other words, I've lived a long time. I'm old. The Lord told me it's time for me to go. And before I leave, I've got a few things to say. That's what's going on here. And Noah, we know, was a prophet. He had received revelation from God, didn't he? I mean, he was the one that was told the flood is coming. He's the one that preached for over 130 years saying the flood is coming. This is a prophet of God. He, he hears from the Lord. So he's got something to say. And you know what I think the point is here? Is that Noah is looking at his kids. And he's going, Ham, I know, listen carefully, based on what has happened here, that you are creating an influence on your children, a bad influence on your children. And your youngest son, Canaan, he's going to pick up on that. I'm prophesying here. 
I'm not worried about Cush. I'm not worried about Mizraim. I'm not worried about Put. But when I look at Canaan, your youngest son, I see him picking up on your influence. In other words, this is not like a curse, like I've thrown a curse on you. Does that make sense? What this really is, is it's saying, hey, I see, I see the path that your kid is going down. And it's going to lead to a bad place. That's what Noah's trying to say. Now, we've got to remember something about this. This is written at a specific time in history, isn't it? Here's Moses. He's, he's trying to get together the people of Israel. If you're not familiar with the whole story, this was written right around 2,000 years before Jesus Christ was born. 4,000 years ago. It's a long time. And at that time, Moses is trying to take the people of Israel. They've been living in Egypt for 430 years. And he's going to lead them out of Egypt. Does that make sense? And he's trying to explain to these people where they come from. That's what he's doing. And he's, putting to, he's got a bunch of old records that have been collected by the people for years and years. And he's editing it all together into one place. Does that make sense? So he's going to pick and choose out of those records what is important for the people at that time. At that time. See, the people of Israel are going to be used by God as an instrument of justice. They're going to be going into the land of Canaan. That's what God has a plan. He says, I'm going to take you out of Egypt. I'm going to send you back into the land of Canaan that I promised to your forefather Abraham. And the reason I have waited 430 years, the Bible says it as clear as day, the Canaanites got worse and worse and worse. And they got to a place where they were just not redeemable and God knew it. Does that make sense? See, here's something that we need to understand about God. Listen to me on this. Listen to me. If I say to my wife, I love you, and I want you to love me back. And the way I'm going to make you love me is I'm going to stick a gun to your head and make you say, I love you. I'm going to force you to say you love me. Force you to be in relationship with me. Is that real? No, it's not. If I wind you up like a little toy, that every time I walk in the door, I love you. Okay, that's not love. That's a computer program. God understands that for you and I and every other human being on this planet to honestly be able to love God, we must be able to choose not to. Without that choice, there is no love. God has to allow evil to exist. People constantly complain, if God was really good, he wouldn't allow evil. No, 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 no. Because God is good, he allows evil. Because without the allowance of choice, there would be no love. Love wouldn't exist. But, and this is extremely important, God does allow evil, but only for a time. And justice will come. Justice will come. Yes, God does allow evil because he needs to allow choice and he needs to allow love. And God values love so much because he is love, he will allow this. But the day will come. He will warn people. He will give them a conscience. He will send prophets. He will do everything he can to get people to turn back to the way he created them to live and be. But the day will come when he will say, enough! I've given you your chance. And when that day comes, justice will fall. But God is also merciful, which is why he allows it for so long. He goes, I'm allowing you, I'm giving you every chance. I've given you an entire life. I let you live 80, 90 years. You can, you can shake your fist at me all the way up until your last breath. And you can be in the hospice and he all the way up to the end, and some pastor from 14.6 shows up and leads you to me, and I'll wipe your sins away as if they never existed because I'm so awesome I can do that. That's who God is. He gives us a life that we can, we can ignore him, and he still can set us free. That's the awesomeness of our God. But justice will come. Everybody dies. None of you are getting out of this alive. 
You're just not. And people say, well, what about the rapture? You're leaving the body behind, thank you. No one gets out of this alive. Does that make sense? Death is inevitable to all of us. It's just a question of when and how. Now, the issue here is that God is saying, the people in the land of Canaan have gotten so evil, I'm going to send you in, and you're going to wipe them out. But I want you to know why it's happening. I want you to know why. You see, Ham had a bad influence on his youngest son, Canaan. And Canaan picked up on it. We're not exactly sure what it was. But the people of Canaan, listen to this. Archaeological history shows us that the people of Canaan, they were not just regular evil. These people, we have found fields. I am not making this up. Archaeologists have found literally fields of little jars about this big. Inside those jars, you will find the bones of toddlers and infants that have been sacrificed to their gods after being raped. That's how they worshipped their gods. These people were vile beyond belief as far as cannibalism. They had gotten so far that God said, enough. I'm sending my people in and justice will come. People, people as recently as two days ago were mocking me on my, uh, my Twitter feed. I, I have an, an evolution creation website. It's one of my big things. And, and there's always the mockers. They're always going to come. You believe in that God who believes in genocide. No, I believe in the God who believes in justice. That's not genocide. That's justice. He is the creator of life. Therefore, he has the right to tell you when you can breathe and when you can't. So many of us think that we've got it all figured out. How many of you know that if God wants to take you, you've got nothing to say about it? You may be in the prime of life and have a heart attack tonight because the Lord said, I'm calling you home. Yes, you will if you know the Lord. <laughs> if you don't, it's bad news. You see, now that's what it was. And the people, the people of Israel, they needed to know why God was sending them there. Does that make sense? That's what this is all about. Now, unfortunately, and I need to be very clear about this, this passage of Scripture has been used, how many of you know, it has been twisted, misinterpreted, and misused to justify things like racism and slavery for hundreds of years. And it's a lie. I want to make that very, very, very clear. This passage was used in this country 150 years ago to say that black people, because they are descendants of Ham, they deserve to be in slavery because of this curse. That was being spoken on the radio and in television as recently as the 1960s right here in the United States. It is a lie. And this is something that gets under my skin like nothing else. Who is this curse to? Ham or Canaan? Canaan, not Ham. Yes, it's true. Many of Ham's descendants did go into North Africa and populated the African nation. But you know that many of Ham's descendants also went into what is today Saudi Arabia, southern Iraq. Some of them went into India. Some of them went as far as China. Native Americans are direct descendants of Ham. You've got a wide range of colors there, don't you? This has nothing to do with color or race. The people of Canaan, there was a curse on them. And God fulfilled that curse when the people of Israel came in and knocked them out. And the, those that were, remained became their servants. This was fulfilled. This was fulfilled under Joshua in about 1500 B.C. That's what it's about, period. It has nothing to do with race. Let me make that very clear. You know what I think it really does? It what, what, what is this all about? It's about the influence that Ham had on his son, isn't it? What can we draw in the 21st century? I think it describes the influence that a parent can have. I think it demonstrates that our way of life can have a stunningly powerful effect on our kids even when we don't intend it. There are so many people that were naughty when they were in their 20s. And now that they're in their 40s and 50s, they got it all figured out because they've been serving God. And they're freaking out because their kids are doing the same things they did when they were in their 20s. And they're going, why? Hello? Your life is not in a vacuum. You will have an influence. If you choose to live an ungodly life, it will affect your kids. 
And you don't know which one because it didn't affect Cush, Mizraim, or Put, did it? Canaan's the one that got it. And we don't know why. Because there's one thing we also have to keep in mind. All of your kids have a choice. They can look at your life and go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow that example because it's a good example. Or I'm going to follow that example because it's a bad example. It reminds me of two twins, twin girls. They were both raised by an alcoholic mother. She was horrible. 20 years later, one of the twins, these are identical twins. One of them is a mother and a wife and doing great and hasn't had a drink and nothing. And when you ask her why, she says, well, with a mother like that, I'm not going to follow that. But the other girl, identical twin, same house, same place. She's a raging alcoholic. And when you ask her why, well, with a mother like that, what do you expect? Do you see? It's extremely important that we master this point. And here's the key. This is what I think we can draw out of this. That we need to realize that our way of life will be an influence far beyond our lifetime. You cannot live carelessly. And for those of you that are looking at me and going, my kids are all grown, I no longer have an influence on them. Wake up. My father still has a very, very strong influence in my life. Watching how he faces getting older has an influence on how I want to face getting older. It doesn't end. My father has a tremendous influence on his grandchildren and on my cousins. They all look up to Uncle Gary. They all show up at his house because he's a godly man and they want to be like him. Does that make sense? You can't live careless. That's what we're learning here. we got to work hard to pass on a godly heritage to our descendants. It can last for centuries. This influence that Ham had on Canaan had an influence 500 years later. And if you raise your children, if you raise your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, those that look up to you, the youth in this church, if you live a godly life, you can have an influence that if the Lord tarries, could last for centuries. Good or bad. Which influence do you want to have? Which influence do you want to have? That's what we can learn from this. How many of you know I think there's a whole lot more here? It's a thing with me. Let's go on to Genesis chapter 10. We'll get to the fun part, the names. Here we go. Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, Yapeth. And sons were born to them after the flood. Now we're about to dive into chapter 10. This man here up on the screen, William Albright, was one of the greatest archaeologists of the Middle, uh, in the Middle East, period. In fact, his work is standard. If you're going to learn anything about the Middle East, you're going to study Albright. Albright said that Genesis chapter 10, which is called the Table of Nations, is one of the most astonishingly, astonishingly accurate records ever written in all of history. It has been confirmed time and time and time again by sources outside the Bible to show that what you're about to get into is 100% accurate. Isn't that cool? Albright says you can see this in the records of the Hittites, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, and the Egyptians. It all confirms that what we are about to read just happens to be the truth. Amazing. Did you know that modern, modern archaeologists who are not Christians, modern linguists who believe in the theory of evolution have all agreed that Genesis chapter 10 is accurate. They have no choice because it's the truth. It's amazing. Now, this was written about 2,000 years before Christ, but it was written, it was not written by Moses, it was edited by Moses. He was taking older records that he had and he was compiling them in one place. And he's going to give you a list of about 70 families. These are not just individual people. These are people that had families, and the family needed a name, so they took the name from the 
the older person, the patriarch. Does that make sense? So they, they, these names became tribal and family names. Now those names changed over time because languages change over time. And the fun part is you could take this name and trace it all the way through history and you could see how it changed and it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 10. You will see this in names of places. You will see this in names of cities. Uh, and it just traces all the back. Now it doesn't include everybody. It only focuses in on the people that the nation of Israel was going to come up against or who they were most familiar with. That would be the Hittites and the Egyptians and so on. And you know what it is? It's designed to show Israel, the people of Israel, where they came from. How many of you know that knowing where you came from can have a powerful effect on where you're going? How many of you know that that's true? I mean, anybody who's ever really known, how many of you have ever known or are an orphan. It's amazing. Orphans can be raised in a step family. They could be raised in a step family from this big. And there's something different, isn't there? There's something different in their attitude. And there's a seeking and there's a, I got to know, where, where did I come from? We need it as human beings. We got to know. It helps us to move forward in our life. And without it, we struggle. And we identify with our family because we need it. God knows we need it. So he said, children of Israel, I'm going to teach you where you came from because you need to know that's going to help you where you're going. It's the same concept. You know how much I hate the theory of evolution. How many of you missed that part? <laughs> the theory of evolution says that you are basically a descendant of an ape-like creature. You're a hairless primate. That's really what you are. And they drill this into people long enough, and if all you are is an animal, then why shouldn't you just act like one? You see, when you believe that that's where you came from, then the only thing that matters is the impulse of the moment. And whatever impulse is the strongest or the best one that I think it is, I'm just going to go with that because I'm just an animal. I answer to no one. When you think that's where you came from, it will affect where you are going. You parents out there need to love your children. They need to feel secure in it. Because when they know where they came from, I am secure in my mom and my dad, or my mom and my stepdad, or my, or my dad and my stepmom. It doesn't matter. Blended families can do it just as well. If you love those people, and they feel secure in where they came from, it helps them get where they need to go. It's desperate that we know and understand this. That's what these people needed to know. Now, you've got to understand something a little even more powerful than this. These people have been living in Egypt for 430 years. That's twice as long as the United States has been a country. All they've ever known, except for the stories that were passed down to them, these old records that they had, other than that, all they've ever heard all their lives is that the Egyptians are the master race and we are the dirt under their fingernails. We're just slaves. We're scum. The Egyptians wouldn't even eat in the same room as the children of Israel because they're the scum. And if you've been treated this way for 430 years, that you're not as important, you're not as enlightened. The Egyptians ruled the world. They built incredible monuments that have stood the test of time to this very day. It's rather intimidating when all you are is the water carrier. And here's these people coming out of the land of Egypt. And Moses says, I'm going I'm to take you from that mentality to being an instrument of God's judgment to becoming a great nation of your own. They couldn't, they couldn't get their minds wrapped around it, could they? they well, how, how can we do that? I mean, sometimes we come down on them, don't we? We read their story about their grumbling and complaining in the desert, don't we? And we think, well, we wouldn't do that. Hey, if you'd spent 430 years being told you're a dirt bag, you're going to believe it. It took 40 years for God to pound into their heads, I am the living God, you trust me, I don't care what your past is. And how many of you know it's the same for you? We sit there and wallow in it. I did this, I failed here. And we let our past chain us down. We're still slaves to stupid choices we made when we were 20. Or 10. You know what I'm saying? And the living God says, no, 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 no. 
You put your trust in me. And your past is meaningless. In fact, let me show you. This whole table of nations, I'm going to show you something about it. We're all in the same boat, kid. That's what we're about to learn. But you know the key that we need to get here today? Look. You've got to realize your past does not have to influence your future, guys. You do not have to be a slave to it. My God can wash your sins away. My God can take your unrighteousness and make it look as white as snow. My God can take you from prison and bring you out and make you a king. My God is awesome, and there's nothing he cannot do. There is no past that he cannot defeat. There is no choice that you have made that he cannot forgive. That's how awesome my God is. Do you know him? I hope you do. Because we need to let go of our mistakes. Because even the best of us has a past. Even the best of us. You know one of the most beautiful things that I see here when I look around here? I see God redeeming people. And I look around this room and I see the descendants of Ham. I see the descendants of Yapheth. And I see the descendants of Shem. We have Europeans in this room, the descendants of Yapheth. We have Middle Easterners in this room who are a mix between Shem and Ham. We have descendants of Ham. We have descendants in this room that are from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation on the planet. And the living God has done what human civilization could never do and made us into a family. Human philosophy can't do that. Human civilization can't do that. But the living God can. That's what God can do. Take a look at this. Genesis chapter 10, verse 2. The sons of Yapheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Yavan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Repeth, and Tugamar. The sons of Yavan were Elisha, Tarshish, Ketim, and Dodanim. And from these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, according, uh, everyone according to his language, according to their families and into their nations. Now, archaeological discoveries have shown us from various different tablets and monuments and ancient historians such as Josephus, writing in about 400 years before Christ, Plutarch, writing in the first century, Josephus, also writing in the first century, confirm these things. Now, the first thing we need to understand about all of these people, now get this in your heads, every last one of you come from Turkey. You all come from the area right around a little place called Mount Ararat. And to this day, modern historians scratch their head and go, you know, modern civilization seems to have started right around Turkey, Asia Minor. Really? I know a book that tells us that. <laughs> and you know what? Linguists, I was, you know, I'm a language major. I studied the French language. Uh, when I got my bachelor's degree. Now, what have they discovered? All of the, there's, for some strange reason, there's, just three major language groups. Hmm, Shem, Ham, Yep. Okay, never mind. There's three major language groups, and they all trace back to the Middle East. Amazing. Right here. It's right there. In fact, let's take a look a little deeper in this. Let's take a look at this map. Now, this is where the, the, the people went. Now, it's a little hard to see uh, when you're looking at it. This is uh, Saudi Arabia here. This is Africa, North Africa. This is going to be Turkey. This is uh, Italy. This is uh, Macedonia, Greece. This is uh, Turkey. Russia is up here. This over, that direction is India. So I'm going to be speaking really, really quick. I'm going to go through this. Um, we thought about printing this for you and put it in your bulletin, but it didn't print real well. So anyway, uh, let's go through this a little bit. Now, this is amazing. And you know what? It shows you your Bible can be trusted. That's, a, that's an exciting part about this. Okay, Gomer and Ashkenaz. G Gomer and Ashkenaz are, are Germany. They settled in the north. The word Gomer was moved over time into the word Germany. In fact, German Jews to this day call themselves the Ashkenazi. Okay, because they know this history. Repeth uh, became Rifath. And over time, it became Europe. It was just, you know, twisted over time. Togarma is where we get the word Turkey, Turkmenistan. All of those names in that area come from the word Togarma. Magog, Meshach, 
and Tubal all settled near each other. Roman historians say that they settled up north of the Black Sea, and um, they settled near each other, and the word Magog and Meshech became the words Muscovy, Moscow. The word Tubal became the word Tobolsk, which is the city of Tobolsk in eastern Russia to this day. Okay, now it's an interesting side note. Ezekiel chapter 38 says that the tribes from Magog and Meshech, their prince's name was Rosh. The, it was called the prince, or prince of Rosh, and the word Rosh became Russia and Russian. That's where these people came from. Madai became the Medes. Yavan in uh, Yavan became Yavana, which later became Ionia, which is translated into Greece. That's where uh, the sons of Yavan went. Elisha, the Greek word for Elisha is hellish, and that's where you get the word Hellenistic. Those are the Greek peoples. Now, Tarshish is probably Tartesso in Spain. They moved way over here. You can see Tarshish over there in Spain. Um, Kittim, we have, uh, we have archaeological records on the island of Cyprus here that say that the original name of this island was Kittim or Makhtim. Makhtim means the land of Kittim, and that was later translated into Makhtimia, which became Macedonia. That's what this whole area is to this day. Um, the word Donadim, Dodanim became these islands right here between uh, Greece and Turkey are to this day called the Dardanelles. That's where the Dardanim name went. Tiras became the Thracians who moved to Italy and changed their name to Etruscans. So the Italians came from Tiras. Um, now, it's interesting that the Italians also mixed some of these uh, Yapethites also mixed with Kaftorum. These are from Ham, and uh, that is very interesting. Uh, and the reason I say that it's interesting is that my own family tree, we did a DNA study. This is just off my notes. We did a DNA study on my family. Here's what we found. We found, you're going to love this, that about 85% of my DNA is Italian. But the other small percentage is Arabic and Chinese, which is where I get my eyes when I smile. Okay, now, <laughs> if you look, Kaftorum. Do you see that Kaftorum? The Kaftorum later, be, later moved this direction. You can see these red arrows here. The Sinites and the Kaftorites moved this way, and the name changed from Kaftor to Cathay, which later changed to China. And you can see it right in my DNA. Isn't that amazing? That's just cool. I mean, you may not think it's cool, but it just gives me goosebumps. Okay, Genesis chapter 10, verse 6 says, The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Reama, Sabtaka, and the sons of Reama were Sheba and Dedan. Now, Cush, the ancient name for Cush is Kish, which became Ethiopia. And the Ethiopian tribes, Mizraim is well known to be Egypt. Mizraim, the first king, the ancient legendary king of uh, Egypt was Menes. Menes comes from the word Mizraim. Does that make sense? In fact, in Arabic, how do you pronounce um, Egypt in Arabic? Masr. It starts with an M. Okay, it's the same. Uh, it's the same word. It's been translated down all these years. Put became Libya. And Canaan, of course, became the Canaanites. Now, Seba moved south, and they became the Sabaeans, which later became the Sudanese. The land of Sudan is where they settled, and they still have that name to this day. Havala, Sabta, Khayama, Sabtaka, Sheba, and Dedan are all known as Arabian tribes. There are Bedouin tribes to this day that can trace their names back to these names. Now, Genesis chapter 10, verse 8, Cush begat... Nimrod, the name is pronounced Nimrod in uh, Hebrew. We'll just say Nimrod. Uh, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalna, and the land of Shinar. The land of Shinar is the land of Iraq to the, today. Now, from that land, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Rezin. 
between Nineveh and Calah. That is the principal city. Now, if we can go back for a second to that last slide. I just want to show this real quick, and I, I don't want to bore you with, with the whole history lesson here. One more. I've got to get the, the map. <clears throat> okay, here's what happened. This is right here, Mount Ararat, where the X is. And all of these tribes settled in. This is Iraq and Iran today. This is the city of Babylon. And you can see by this color purple that this is where human beings settled right after the flood until God broke them up, which we're going to see in Genesis chapter 11. But what's interesting is, is that Nimrod founded this city, Babel. Okay, now he founded that city, but something happened because he left town. And he went and founded another city called Nineveh, which is up here. You can't quite see it. Uh, now, Nineveh, legend has it, when you dig up the rocks, was founded by a guy named Ninas or Nimrod. Funny, that's in the Bible, and you can dig it right out of the sand. Now, why did he go to Nineveh and found a city there? Now, this is very important. Let's take a look at the word Nimrod. Nimrod in Hebrew, the word means rebel. The word means rebel. Now, also, it says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. The word before in Hebrew is panim. Panim means in the face of, and it's negative. Does that make sense? So really, what a better translation of this would be that Nimrod was a mighty hunter who was up in God's face with his rebellion. Does that make sense? That's what it really should be translated. He was the first tyrant. Now, it is very likely that Nimrod was a great hunter, and this was the days right after the flood when human beings were lunch, because all these animals are competing, aren't they? Not long after the flood, a few hundred years. So Nimrod became very popular because he protected people and he killed the big animals that were eating everybody. And he gathered a following. And eventually, he gathered power. And that's what human beings do, don't they? They gather power. And he started an empire, the first empire, Babel. We're going to find out what happens to Babel when we get to chapter 11. But in the meantime... What happened is he built this complex of cities, and we know from archaeology that this is all well confirmed. Legendary stories of Nimrod or Ninas or Nine or whatever that they found in the, in the rocks and in the dirt. Later, he was worshipped as a god, in fact, the truth is. But in verse 11, he leaves Babel and he founds the Assyrian Empire. It's interesting that his cousin's name was Asher, and that's where we get the word Assyria. Because he went over there, Asher had settled, and he went over there and took over his town. And built the city of Nineveh and uh, those areas there. Now, here's what's interesting about it. Take a look at Babylon today. This is what's left of Babylon today. Now, here's the city of Nineveh. This is the city of Nineveh today. That dirt pile on the left. That's it. Now, what I think is interesting is that when this was written, both Babylon and Nineveh were very real powers, weren't they? When this was written 2,000 years before Jesus was born. Why am I showing you the ruins of these two cities today? Because you know what? Listen to me on this. When Moses wrote this down, the Hittite empire was already legendary and in the dust. Did you know that? And what, is, what, what the people of Israel had to realize is that here's what God was saying. The sons of Heth became the Hittite empire. And here you guys are. I'm going to take you into the land of Canaan. I've already destroyed the Hittites. And I'll nail the Babylonians and the Ninevites too. And he did. All you have to do is read the book of Nahum and you'll see what happened to Nineveh. Now, What's interesting about this is that the Holy Spirit wanted those people to know, and listen, he wants you to know that empires may rise and empires will fall, but God's plan carries through the centuries. It carries through. And you know what's interesting about this is the only thing that really matters is that you serve God. Because here's Nimrod who's shaking his face his fist in, in God's face and saying, I will make a name for myself. I will be a rebel. I will build a great city. Look at your great city, Nimrod. 
You're up in your face with your rebellion against God. I will make a name for myself. That's all that's left. That's all that is left. Listen to me. Every human effort we make to make a name for ourselves, to build our own kingdom, will end up here. Did you hear me? And that's what you and I need to draw out of this. It's going to crumble into dust. If your efforts in life are all about building a name for yourself, how many of you know people like this today? They're all about how big their house is, how many cars they have, how much money they have in the bank, how many books that they have written, how many degrees they have hanging on their wall. This is where you're going to end up. The greatest empires in the history of the world are nothing more than dust today. And we Americans in our arrogance think that we rule the world, and this is where we're going to end up. Because the only thing that matters is serving the living God. It's the only thing that lasts. It's the only thing that lasts. Look what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. He said, look, here's my final conclusion. Solomon, the richest man in history, he, a thousand years before Christ was born, a thousand years after Genesis 10 was edited by Moses, Solomon had an empire that stretched all the way from Damascus to Egypt. He was a powerful ruler. He had a palace and a thousand wives, the most beautiful women on earth. He was rich beyond everything. And here's what he said. Here's my conclusion. Fear God, obey his commands, for this is the duty of every person, because God will judge us for everything we do. Did God judge Babel? Did God judge Nineveh? The greatest empires in history, people who said, I will make a name for myself, God will judge. And that's the key we need to draw out of this. Listen to me on this, please. We need to realize that our ambition has no influence over our destiny. You can have all the ambition in the world, but your destiny is in God's hands. Let me say that again. You can have all the ambition in the world. I will make a name for myself. I will be wealthy and healthy. There's an irony every time I read about somebody. You know, I think about Patrick Swayze. Patrick Swayze was an actor. He was incredibly good shape. Have you ever seen that? I mean, he was in amazing shape. Got cancer and died before he was 60. There's an irony there, isn't there? We make a name for ourselves. Is that what really matters in life? You can have all the ambition in the world, but God holds your destiny in his hands. And we need to focus our lives on God's eternal plans because even the greatest of us, the greatest empires that have ever existed, the Romans, the Greeks, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, they are nothing more than legends and buckets of sand. And the living God was trying to tell these people, look, you all came, you all of you came from Mount Ararat. You are no greater or less than the Egyptians or anybody else that you're going to face. And he wants us to know in the 21st century, it doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what your heritage is. It doesn't matter if you're rich, if you're poor. You are all headed the same direction. So get it in your heads that you better have your life wrapped around my kingdom because if you don't, you're going to end up being in the same dust that Nineveh and Babylon and Egypt and the Hittites and the Americans will be. So what have we learned? You bet. You got it. We've learned that our influence can have an effect that can last for centuries. Haven't we learned that? And we need to take care that we have a, the right influence. We've got to be proactive about it. We've learned we don't have to be chained to our past, do we? Because our God can wipe it away. And we have learned that our ambitions, they don't change our destiny. You didn't think you were going to get that out of those names, did you? Let's pray. Holy Father, you are the living God. You are the one that created human beings out of the dust. You are the one that said, I will breathe life into them. 
But unless they turn themselves over to me, they are going to go back to the dust. And we have learned today that the greatest empires in history, the greatest rebels who stood in the face of God and said, I will build an empire, are nothing more than heaps of sand today. And we, Lord God, have learned that we must take care of the influence that we have on our children and our grandchildren. But most importantly, Lord, we have learned that we have got to focus our attention, our efforts, not on building a name for ourselves, but on being about your business. And there are people in this room that have gotten so wrapped up in their worries about their 401k that they have forgotten this truth. There are people in this room that have not let go of their past and it has chained them down and they are not living for God today because they think they have no choice and it's a lie. There are people in this room that need to focus and live intentionally. And I pray that every person in this room contemplate the power of the Word of God which explain to us that we're all in the same family. There is no race. There is only the human race. And we, Lord God, are your children. And we have got to turn our lives over to following you 100%. That's what we've learned. Because even Nimrod is dead. Nebuchadnezzar is dead. The pharaohs of Egypt are buckets of sand. The greatest among us all end in the same place. And we have got to be about your business. And I pray, Father God, that you help us to make a decision today that we're going to turn over our lives to you. If you're listening to me, keep your head bowed. I don't want anybody looking around because I don't want anybody embarrassed. But if there's somebody here and you're thinking to yourself, you know, I've played the religion game for a while. But it's been all about me. And I have not yet made Jesus of Nazareth the king of my life. And I heard today, it doesn't matter what my ambition is, I'm going to end up looking like Nineveh eventually. If that's you and you need to turn your life over to Jesus Christ and make him king, here's how you do it. Just pray like this. Say, Father God, I've gone my own way and done my own thing up in your face like Nimrod did. Forgive me because I've sinned against you. You are my king. I will focus the attention of my life on following and serving you. A simple prayer like that, my friend, is the beginning of an eternity with God. But you've got to mean it from your heart, or it's just words. Yeah, we're going to sing another song here. I've got to ask the ushers to come up, too. Let's, let's uh, end our prayer. And we're going to do another song. These guys are going to worship, and I hope. How many of you got something out of today, or, or did I need to rewrite that? Okay, I'm sorry if I went long, but you know what? It's good stuff, isn't it? We learned something here. How many of you learned something?